Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Um, you will know that through this live stream, I bring to you um, interviews with friends from all over the world. And um, today I have with me Vishal Thurja of an Indian NGO called A Dream A Dream. Um, Vishal is someone who I've respected uh, for a very long time uh, and his achievements are for all to see. Uh, Vishal, welcome to this live stream. Thank you, Vikas. It's a pleasure and uh, an honor to be here in this live stream with you. Tell me, uh, Vishal, what is a Dream a Dream? Uh, Dream a Dream is a nonprofit based out of India. It focuses on working with young people growing up in adverse circumstances and helping them develop the skills and capacities that they need to thrive in the 21st century. And tell me, what precipitated the setting up of Dream a Dream? Was there a particular incident that you came to realize, crikey, this is an issue? Uh, what was that? What was that critical thing that happened that made you found this NGO? Uh, well, there were many things, but I think primarily the trigger was uh, when I was 21 years old. I got an opportunity to go to Finland on an exchange program. Uh, having grown up in a relatively lower middle class Indian family, I was the first kid in the family to ever travel abroad, sit in a plane. So I took up that opportunity. And Finland works on a strong social welfare economy system. So what I experienced there was very high levels of dignity of labor. I made friends with the bartender. I made friends with the security guard. They all had beautiful homes. They had good quality of life. And they took pride in who they were and the work they did which I hadn't seen growing up in India with its class and caste system. So having experienced this whole new way of living, I wanted to bring this idea of dignity back to India. And I was 21, and of course, at 21, you believe you can do anything. So I came back and started talking to a bunch of friends and said, I want to do something about changing the way we look at dignity in our country. A bunch of people said it's a good idea, and that's how Doom Dream came about. And so tell us a little bit, fast forward from the age of 21 to where you are today. What are the things that a Dream a Dream does under normal circumstances? Put COVID to the side for a second. Uh, what, what are your achievements? What is it that you've done, et cetera? Sure. Uh, so I work with young people. Uh, uh, we do it from three different lenses. We have direct intervention programs where we work with about 10,000 young people every year directly through our own curriculums and pedagogical approaches in Bangalore, which is focused on developing their life skills. And here we have seen nearly 96% of the kids year on year show a significant improvement in life skills. The second piece of the intervention is we work with teachers, where we train teachers on bringing more creativity, empathy, and care in classroom environments through an investment in their own well being and an investment in their facilitation skills. We have now, in the last eight years, worked with over 10,000 teachers across India, uh, impacting about 250,000 kids. Uh, the third lens of our work is our work with the state governments. Uh, we work with seven state governments today, either in a teacher development program, building capacities of the teacher to integrate life skills approaches and empathy-based pedagogies. Uh, or second, helping governments integrate life skills through curriculums. An example of that is uh, we've worked with Delhi government now for over two years and helped them introduce what we call a happiness curriculum in over 1,000 public schools and for about 800,000 kids every single day. The curriculum integrates mindfulness practices, life skills approaches, storytelling, and play-based activities for children to change their perception of school from that of fear to that of joy and engagement and change the relationship they have with the teacher from that of fear to that of engagement. Uh, so these are the three ways that we work with. But Vishal, you know, when my, my very scant knowledge of India um, uh, tells me that it's, um, you know, the education culture is one that everyone strives to attain the best in the tests and the assessments that are provided uh, so that they can get to uh, un understandably great institutions uh, of learning. Um, and the focus on, on grades in particular, how does that translate to your work and your experience? And what, because what you're saying is 
uh, a, a departure from what I at least understand of the Indian education system? Uh, you're absolutely right. And I think that's a great question to dwell on. Uh, that the Indian education system traditionally has been focused on academic outcomes, rankings, grading, uh, and that's been an aspiration for most parents. Uh, however, that is failing a majority of our kids. What we need to recognize is that uh, today about 98% of the kids at the primary level go to school in India, but less than 30% of them finish university. One, because there are not enough universities to take in that kind of numbers. Uh, second, because you, because of this ranking and grading system, uh, the system is really designed around letting people off or letting people go along the way. So the numbers keep decreasing along the way because 80% of the children entering the school system today are first generation school goers, which means that they don't necessarily have the support systems and the capacities to engage with learning. A good way to understand that is Children growing up in some kind of disadvantage, some kind of marginalized backgrounds in the early years of growing up, when they experience adverse life circumstances, such as lack of food or nutrition or neglect, or in extreme cases, exposure to abuse or violence or abandonment or being orphaned, it impacts their ability to achieve developmental milestones. What that means is they don't fully develop their cognitive and non-cognitive faculties. And when they enter the school system at the age of four or five, they're not fully developed to engage with learning. And the school systems are not designed to create learning engagement for these students. So they keep falling off the tracks. Uh, so that's not working for a majority of our students. So what we need is a whole new way of looking at education and life skills acts as an amazing bridge to help these children catch up to their developmental milestones and also build the skills that they need to respond to a fast pace of change in the world. No, not wanting to attribute any kind of blame, um, but how do you persuade parents who, who who understand that by achieving, you know, X grade, you know, their, their little child will go and do something quite marvelous. Um, yeah. how, how do you engage with that stakeholder community? Yes. Um, Parents are resistant because they've also been fed into this narrative that uh, the way out of poverty for us and our family is for my child to go to school and finish school and go to college and finish school. Um, so the parents are resistant to this idea of an investment in life skills or well-being. Uh, however, as we've now started work, we've worked with communities now for about 20 years, we're beginning to see a very clear shift in parental perceptions. We're seeing parents now ask questions around the education system saying that this education system is not working for my child because at the end of the day, even if my child finishes university, there are no jobs out there. We graduate 12 million graduates in, from universities in India every year, but we're not creating more than 200 to 300,000 new jobs. Our parents are caught on to that and they're realizing then what is the alternative if the school is not the way out of poverty for my family? Uh, so that perception is shifting. Okay. And tell me, in terms of the work of your NGO, Dream a Dream, how has it been impacted during this pandemic? Uh, quite a bit, uh, uh, because the impact has been quite severe, uh, not primarily around the program itself. I mean, all our programming has stopped for the last three months. Uh, so we're not necessarily doing any work with young people directly or with teachers. Uh, but more importantly, the impact on the gains that we have had in all these years. Uh, children who are part of our programs now, if they're going to drop out of school because their families have moved back to the villages or because uh, parents are going to prioritize education for one kid or the other, or some of the kids are going to become caregivers for younger siblings or income earners in their families because families have lost livelihoods and incomes. Uh, all the gains that we had in building agency and life skills for these kids, we're going to lose those gains uh, because the economic impact of this pandemic has been more severe on marginalized communities. And so when you talk about um, one of the focus areas being well-being, um, can you just delve a little bit deeper into that, please? Sure. Uh, 
So there are two lenses to that. One is the well-being of the young person, the child. And here the lens is really around, again, child adversity. Uh, so, you know, I'll give you an example of that. Uh, in the early years, we used to work with kids who used to live in shelter homes and in institutional care systems. And when we used to go there, the children used to come running up to us and jump on us and hug us and you know, touch our clothes and ask us who we are. And we thought these children were loving and caring and so giving. But imagine if I walked into your home for the first time as a stranger and if you had a 10 year old kid, they wouldn't come running up to me. They will hide behind you. They will wait for a indication from you that it's all right to come out and say hello. Even then they say hello and quickly run away. Now that is normal behavior. You want children to have an instinct for their own protection and survival. But children who are abandoned or orphaned because of not achieving developmental milestones, they don't have the ability to engage in healthy relationships, for example, which end up in them being part of abusive relationships as they become adults. So the whole idea of well-being comes from the space of helping children catch up to their developmental milestones, which they have missed out on because of adversity. To take the same scenario around, you know, at the age of 18, 19, when you pick, when you hire young people from marginalized communities into jobs, the first conflict they have at job, they run away. They don't know how to ask for leave, so they run away and leave the job. They don't know how to manage conflict at work. They don't know how to communicate their needs at work, so they leave their jobs and go. This is not because they're not interested in, in, in a livelihood or in a job. It's because they don't have the basic life skills to engage with life and work itself. So that's why an investment in well-being is absolutely critical, not just from a space which is helping them get jobs and livelihoods, but for them to have a healthy life and a good quality of life in the long run. Thanks a lot, Vishal. And during this um, during this um, pandemic, uh, um, you've actually launched a global campaign um, that I'd love for you to tell those who watch this live stream a little bit more about and specifically how they can engage. Yes. Well, thank you, Vikas. Um, so recently, we launched a campaign called the What If Campaign. Uh, the What If campaign really came from our own reflections of engaging with young people when the lockdown in India happened. When the lockdown in India happened, we realized that other than the learning loss, there were a whole host of other challenges that young people were facing. Uh, there was anxiety, there was trauma, there was stress, there was misinformation, there was fake news. Uh, their life itself completely changed because their families lost incomes and livelihoods. Uh, so daily hunger was, was a reality suddenly in the lives of these kids. They didn't have abilities to access online resources because they don't have smartphones or computers or access to internet. There's disproportionate impact that we saw on girls. Um, there were cases of increased violence and abuse uh, that was happening in the home environment now because they were staying with their abusers at home all the time. Uh, so all these challenges then led us to say, you know, we can't just have a response that is dealing with learning loss. We have to have a wholesome response, recognizing that young people are facing a host of different issues, which is resulting in sustained long-term trauma, which is going to impact their emotional and mental well-being. So our response cannot be a panic response of let's just bring online content or digital resources and let's just start online schools and online classes. Our invitation to children, parents, teachers, educators, school leaders, policymakers, nonprofits is first, let's take a pause. What we have experienced for the first time as a global community is grief. And what we have experienced for the first time is that all of us are deeply interconnected as a species. My actions sitting in Bangalore could impact someone in London. Let's stay with that trauma. Let's stay with that grief. Let's go deeper in introspecting and reflecting on the wholesome crisis that our children are facing today. And then from that space, what is our most compassionate offer to our children as we start coming out of this crisis? Are we going to continue to operate from panic and when schools reopen, cram up syllabus, cram up homework for the children so they catch up with their learning, with their academics? Or are we going to help our children make meaning out of the biggest life lesson that they've just had? 
help them heal out of the trauma that they've experienced, help them reconnect with themselves, with their community, with their peers, with their friends, and with the world, because it's a whole new world now. So our invitation to everyone out there is really, let's use this as an opportunity to reimagine education in a post-COVID world. What we have already known for many years, now is an opportunity to bring it to action. And that reimagine can be a collective process. So our invitation is let's take a pause. Let's go still for a moment. And from deep within us, let's see what is our what if statement, which is coming from a deep space of compassion and empathy for ourselves and our children. And a what if statement that helps us reimagine education in a whole different light. So that's really the invitation. And and in terms of what are the, I mean, sure, I can go in hashtag what if and go onto Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, you know, Instagram. Uh, but what is the net net result that you will get from this campaign? What is it that you're striving for? Yeah. Uh, so again, because this is not a dream a dream campaign, this is a community campaign. So we want the community to engage with this campaign in any way which they feel they want to engage in. We want, for example, uh, we want teachers and educators to write to leaders, to write to policymakers uh, about how they want education to happen as schools reopen. Uh, send out open letters to the ministers of education, to the policymakers, to the district education officers. Write about some of the challenges that you are seeing young people in your context are facing. For example, we've got a group of entrepreneurs in Latin America who are beginning to write about what are the challenges that young people in Latin America are facing because of this crisis. Today afternoon, we had a conversation with an organization that engages with parents. They have spoken to about over 10,000 parents in the last two months. And the parents, the way they have understood and responded to the crisis is very different. And the way they have seen the crisis play out for their kids is very different. So parents are actually telling them that, you know, why send my child to school? It obviously is not working. Might as well send my child to work now because that's what we need. So the invitation is let's use this as an opportunity to engage with an idea that education is still critical for our children, but a whole new way of education. And what is that new way of education? We've got a young man in our program, for example, he started his own campaign, engaging with other young people in his community, asking them about what would they like the new education to look like and can they then make one minute videos and send it to education leaders, send it to nonprofit leaders, send it to ministers of education. So it's really a call out. It's a call out saying, let's not go back to the old. Let's use this opportunity to reimagine, repurpose, and whatever that looks like from your context, let's make that happen. Wonderful. Well, Vishal, I, I wish you the very best with this campaign and all of us, uh, please know that um, I'm a big supporter of everything Vishal does, especially this What If campaign. Um, and so uh, the idea is quite simply to write in, given your context, and actually start having a conversation as to what the future could be um, based upon your experiences in the education community and, and through the institutions that you work for and you lead. Um, friends, uh, please join me in thanking Vishal once again. Um, please share this video. Uh, on YouTube, on Facebook, and everywhere else. Let's start getting uh, lots and lots of uh, friends to participate in this activation. I see that there is one of our one of the one of the community members, Domingo, is saying, "What if educa world education leaders and country leaders work together?" Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Those are the kinds mm -hmm. of things that we should have. I know that my friend Marge Brown is watching, and she just said, "Thanks, Vishal." I know that she focuses uh, her comment will help in South Africa. We have uh, we have people from the Philippines, from Nigeria, from I saw some from I think Malaysia, from Saudi Arabia, uh, here are Jodhpur in Rajasthan. Um, you know, everyone is saying, how do we help? And so yeah. thank you for taking the lead. And I think the answer lies in all of us now that Vishal has told us about the what if campaign to get behind it and to do something. But if you are going to post on social media, please do tag or hashtag what if? And Vishal is also, I know, on social media, and you can find him there. Well, thank you once again, we Vishal. A, sorry, because we also have a website for the campaign. 
Please. Uh, it's what if hyphen global dot com. Hold on, let me just write that down for you. What if hyphen? Yeah, global dot com. My B is a sticky key. <laughs> is this right? Yes, that's perfect. Yeah. So go to this website and start getting behind it. Um, please, again, uh, accept my gratitude to you, Vishal, for everything that you've done. And I wish you all success with this campaign. Thank you, Vikas. Thank you for this tremendous.